Boys and girls, what's happening? It is your boy BQ. Welcome to the Negative BQ channel. This is your Impact Lounge TNA Slam Anniversary review for 2024. If it's your first time here, this is the place to be for the TNA fan. Not the not the Mark fans, but the you know the true fans, the hardcore fans, uh, fans that want to see this company succeed. But fans who are honest with what the product is, they're they know what's good, they know what's bad. You know this this is the place for you. I'm a really honest reviewer. I'm a critic. Uh, I, I point out more things that I dislike than I actually like. But that's just the nature of the channel, nature of how I uh, do my reviews. But everything comes from a good place. Everything comes from my heart. Uh, everything comes with wanting to see this company succeed and grow. And uh, we had Slammiversary tonight. Um, I thought this was an okay show. I thought it was a good show. I... I do not categorize it, categorize it as a bad show, but I, I found myself bored several times through this, and uh, I'll, I'll get into those reasons. I think if you were a TNA super fan, you probably enjoyed this show. I'm not going to go ahead and say Mark, because I know we, that's like we're getting dis, in disrespectful territory when we say that. I would say, I wouldn't say that, but I would say if you were a super fan, Someone who can still be honest with the product, but a super fan, you probably enjoy this show. But uh, for those of you who are anywhere between casual fan to super fan, you, you probably thought this was okay. Uh, a lot of the people I talked to felt the same way I did, and there's some who really, really enjoyed it. So you know, it's it wasn't a bad show. So I can't get. I can't knock anybody for saying that this was a great show or that was an A-plus show. I don't think it was. For me, it was like a B. I just thought it was a good show, and that was it. I'm going to talk about the main event first, though, because I do my very best to admit when I'm wrong. And I really clowned this main event. I clowned that they were doing an elimination match, that they were just throwing everybody in there instead of building some kind of storyline. I guaranteed that Joe Hendry and Moose were going to be the last two in this thing. Um, what what the hell else did I say? I said Josh Alexander needs to stay as far away from this main event as possible so that he can uh, improve his character and build upon that and then come back to the main event. I mean, th there were a lot of things I said regarding this, and I was I was very wrong. I was very wrong. Um, I thought that it would have been more impactful if Josh Alexander won. However, Josh Alexander turned heel in this match. And he came out wearing pink, like a pink and black, like a bunch of people were due, playing, playing up to the fucking crowd. I didn't expect in a million years that they would do this. And when you're talking about the build up to this match, it was actually quite genius because when I was reviewing the Go Home show, I had said that Josh was coming off like an afterthought in this, and he was he was the guy. He was the first person to come down. He was the first person to sign a cut the contract. You know what I'm saying? Uh, he was. They had him uh, exchanging dirty looks with Steve Macklin. They come here, and the storyline makes perfect sense that Joe Hendry now became the golden boy, and Josh had was telling him he's a joke. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about, you can see Slammiversary. We've got the six-way match happening. Moose is eliminated like halfway through this thing. So it's like, oh, shit. Moose was the betting favorite to win this thing. Uh, Josh Alexander, I mean, not Josh Alexander, Nick Nemeth, who ultimately won this, was a plus 1,000 betting odds, meaning if you would have bet 100 bucks on Nick Nemeth to win, you would have won $1,000. He was not the favorite. Um, he was tied with Josh Alexander as the third favorite, but Moose was the favorite, followed by Joe Hendry. Frankie Kazarian was dead last, and he was second. I thought he was going to win this thing for a second. But if you didn't see this, Moose was eliminated halfway through. All of a sudden, we're guaranteed a new world champion. That very rarely happens in these type of scenarios. So um, he gets eliminated by Joe Hendry, which what a great way to, to not put the title on Joe Hendry, but to get him over. You to further get him over to to further, um, you know, you know, yeah. I mean, how else I'm going to put it? Get him over with the audience, and then Josh nut kicks him, C4 spike pins him. 
Now Josh ends up losing to Nick Nemeth, and Nick Nemeth ultimately beats Frankie Xarian. They're the final two. Nick Nemeth is your new TNA World Champion. Now, this whole heel turn would have been more effective if Josh won. I would have, uh, I would have probably rated the pay-per-view higher. This is the problem I had with the show. This show was catered to the audience, to the live audience. Which makes sense because there was very little build up to up until the go home show where they kind of they were focused and had a sense of purpose. There was pretty weak build up to this. I was saying that they seem more uh, more focused on getting the four thousand people in the in the arena. So that makes sense. the The show was booked to appease the live audience. The only heel. Now, I can't speak for the opening knockouts match. I didn't get to see it. I tried to watch it before I recorded, but uh, TNA Plus wouldn't, wasn't loading. I assume Giselle Shaw won. I'm, I'm going to assume. There was only one heel in that match, so I'm, I'm going to stand by what I say that she won. And when I say when, the reason I'm pointing out there's only one heel is because the only heel or heels to win a match this entire night was the Militia. Masha Slamovich, Alicia Edwards. Every other single match let me look at the card here real quick and the notes on my phone i took very few notes because i I really frankly was not um not really feeling this show uh yeah every every single match was won by babyface so now the heels are going to be chasing and they had their feel-good moment all the babyface champions were in there um i can understand maybe bound for glory where it's like that's the culmination of the year you know, so the baby faces kind of stand tall, and then you take baby faces into the new year. They did that this year. They kicked off Hard to Kill with all baby faces basically being the champions. It, it just felt like they were trying to appease the audience the whole night. That was that was the problem I had from everyone wearing pink and black to multiple heart attacks, the sharpshooters. Um, but again, I, I just I I have to reiterate. This wasn't my favorite pay-per-view that they've done. It was just a wrestling show, and it was a good wrestling show. And that was it for me. I watched three and a half hours of good wrestling. I guess four and a half if you count the pre-show. It's a lot of wrestling. Wow. Uh, it was just four and a half hours of good wrestling. That, that's the best way that I can put this show into a nutshell. Super fan, you probably really, really like this. If you're anywhere between a super fan and casual fan, you probably thought it was okay. I don't think anyone... I doubt very few many excuse me doubt, I doubt very few people let me rewind rewind I doubt very many people dislike the show but it was it was just kind of okay um again I can't speak on the on the uh, knockouts match to kick off uh Kushida took on Rich Swan on the pre-show uh, Gresham had travel issues and Jordan Grace was already in country for those of you saying why didn't he travel Jordan Grace she's already been there since Wednesday or something like that uh, he had travel issues, so Rich Swan took his place. Actually, it was actually a great match. I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, I enjoy anything Rich Swan does, to be totally honest with you. Kushida wins this. I expected Kushida to beat Jonathan Gresham, so I knew Kushida would likely win this match. Knockouts tag team match. Uh, for me, I enjoyed it uh, because I'm, you know, obviously I'm an Alicia Edwards guy. If you've been following me, uh, but I, I actually uh, enjoyed this quite a bit. But I was wondering where is where is. Lo- I was wondering where was Lars Fredrickson in this whole thing. I was gonna say Lars Sullivan. Where where was he? You know, he was part of this storyline about getting them back on track and taking them back to basics and all that shit. So where where was he as far as being in the corner here? But uh, they won the match. But they didn't win the match. They lost the match. But uh, the militia wins the match. Uh, they do it by cheating. Uh, the the finish of this match was my biggest problem. Uh, I love well, I love the they kind of did the Steiner brothers bulldog to win the match. I thought that was cool, but the finish was my problem. So Masha throws both belts into the ring. Frank the Goof is the referee, okay, and he's trying to return the belt to you know he to have it removed from the ring. He doesn't go to the to the left where the belts are were positioned. He he goes straight forward. So almost as far as you can possibly go, not quite, but almost as far as you can possibly go, call someone over is conversing with them, which seemed like a full 60 seconds. And uh, 
give plenty of time for the militia to hang up the other knockouts championship belt in the corner to send a uh, jobby threat into it. And then they ended up hitting her with the finish. So I enjoy the matchup to that point, but I mean, they make the referees look like such freaking idiots sometimes. And this, this dude is sitting here for uh, seriously a full minute trying to get rid of the knockouts tag team championship belt. So I thought that just looked awful. Um, but of course it was the goof ref. You, know, you can always tie everything uh, back to him. And then we get a surprise match with just Hammer Young. I've said on my podcast, I thought Hammerstone was done with the company. I prefaced that with saying I'm not reporting anything, that I have very little information to go off of. I was taking a very small piece of information I received. And uh, coming to my own conclusion with it, I thought he was gone. So I was happy to see him arrive here because it was actually, uh, I meant to say this last week, if he didn't show up at Slammiversary or uh, the tapings after, he, I, I was like, he's got to be done. Jordan Grace teased that there was going to be surprises at Slammiversary, and I, I told you guys, Jordan Grace has some very hot takes on Twitter, and you have to be very careful. And when TNA does talk about we, who's going to show up, you're not going to believe it. Surprises, they typically underwhelm. The surprises on this were the return of Hammerstone from his three-month hiatus, whatever, two months, and Earl Hebner. So just book a good wrestling show. Stop stop with the, the teasing of who's potentially going to show up because then the fans start fantasy booking all sorts of people up to from whatever Asian chick that was released from NXT. I was going to say Wendy Chu, but I don't th think it's her. Whatever Asian chick, all the way up to Jinder Mahal. But we get Earl Hebner and, and the return of Hammerstone, which I love Hammerstone. He comes out. He wrestles Eric Young. They have an okay match. This motherfucker loses. With one of the shittiest roll-ups I've ever seen, Eric Young wins. And then Eric Young delivers one of his rah-rah speeches. I, I told you guys this a couple months ago. Eric Young is, is now the rah-rah guy for TNA. He is not... Uh, a, a contender he's not uh, I don't know what he does off screen he has to have an off screen role because he does almost nothing on screen uh, except to come out and be the rah rah guy to be Adam Copeland and this is his third rah rah speech and he did it again at the expense of Hammerstone so I'm already pissed off at this point going into the main show because in my mind Hammerstone had no business losing none but there's a trend here Eric Young wins. The babyface wins. We're appeasing the crowd from this point out. That is everything. After the Militia wins, and the previous match before that was Kushida winning as a babyface. I would assume Giselle Shaw won. I don't know for sure. There's the Militia, and then everything else is appeasing the audience the rest of the night. The reason I have an issue with that as a fan, because I love heat. I love to see heat. I love to see heels generate heat. I love when you think a baby face is going to get their come up, comeuppance for the, the heel to just take it one step further and get more heat. Like That's the kind of shit that I enjoy and that I like and I was looking for from this show, but that's not what it was. It was just baby face, baby face, baby face, baby face mm -hmm. winning. Um, so yeah, Eric Young wins. I was, I'm already pissed off at this point. Hardy takes on Dango. The match was fine. I expected Dango to win this thing because he just got the shit kicked out of him by Santana the other day. And I thought, you know, they're doing more with Mr. JDC in the last couple of weeks than they've done in a year and a half with him. And the story was basically that everyone in the system lost. Uh, oddly enough, Alicia Edwards was the only one to still, Alicia, Alicia Edwards the only one was, was still has a title, which is freaking crazy. But, you know, Dango's kind of part of the system. He's not officially part of him. I was thinking, okay, we're going to build more heat on Dango so that he takes it into the um, uh, the tapings with the Hardys. I, I think they're recording this in Montreal, so Jeff can't show up. But I don't know. Um, I knew there was a chance Matt Hardy was going to win this thing, but I, part of me in the back of my mind was like, nah, man, they're going to they're gonna get some more heat on Dango. He just got his ass kicked by Santana. He's not going to get his ass kicked again. He did. Uh, it took like three twists of fates after the match. So Matt Hardy's your winner. Then we get the ABC versus the system. Apparently, that ABC has a new song. 
couldn't hear shit. Why? Because the audio was complete crap for this show. The crowd was dark. Uh, as the show progressed, it seemed like they lit up the crowd a little bit. But a lot of fans were on social media pissed off, complaining, like, light up the crowd. If you're not going to do it for 4,000 people, you're probably never going to do it. Uh, so the show initially was very, very dark. Uh, came, looked a little indie, but the crowd was so loud and so engaged that it it saved it. You know, because this this was a great crowd. Uh, we we could hear them through the majority of the night. There's a couple times they bowed out because something was going on in the ring that was no no bueno. Um, but for the most part, they were very very engaged, very loud, and it, it made for a good visual when they showed the audience. But uh, they they didn't always. You know, it was kind of the way it, it was set up looked like there could have been 2,000 people in there at, at the max, you know, 1,500 people, uh, just the way that a lot of the camera angles are shooting. But every once in a while, they, they bring it all the way out. They zoom out, and you can see 4,000 people. And again, it was great. It looked, it sounded, it sounded very good, but they were trying to appease that audience rather than us watching at home. Uh, they, to me, they did very little to make me want to turn on the show uh, for the fallout, aside from... Uh, the Josh Alexander stuff with his heel turn because that's no one in the world saw that coming. So, you know, aside from that, there was very little that happened here that says, Hey, I want to tune in to see what happens. So that's why I'm saying, you know, heat is what's going to carry over, not the, you know, the, the feel good moments and the raw, raw and all that. Um, but yeah, Jeff Hardy wins this thing. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I was talking about ABC here. They win this thing. ABC beats the system. They come out dressed, dressed like the hearts, appeasing the audience. And um, I really ha- I really did not think they were going to win. I thought, we thought they were going to break up, right? And maybe creatively they did that on purpose. Maybe that was to throw us off, but I don't think anyone is asking for another ABC title run. So that's what that's kind of like what my issue was. It was like, are we just trying to have a feel good moment and then the system's going to get the titles back? I don't know. Um, the one thing I, I want to say ever since probably from this match forward. I won't throw Hardy and Dango versus in there from this match forward. I wrote the same thing in my notes for every song for every excuse me for every match too long. It was the, these matches were way too long, and then you saw at the end of the night, everyone was freaking out because they said there's two, 12 minutes left for the main event. Like, why would you book a full card with an elimination match? Uh, so people were very concerned. We were waiting to see what was going to happen <laughs> when it when it hit. Uh, for me, it was eight o'clock uh, Pacific time. I guess, so I guess it was eleven Eastern that it ended for uh, probably the majority of you, or, or ten Central. These matches were way too fucking long. The, every single match here acted felt like it was never going to end. So I thought this went uh, very, very well. Long. Uh, they said contractual rematch about nine times throughout the match, and then the ABC one, which I just I didn't see coming. They they they're very much stripping the system of their titles, and considering that the militia cheated in their match, they're probably going to Santino's probably going to have this great idea. We're gonna have a knockout tag team championship match and have them have a rematch and Spitfire win. I, I would I would not be shocked if that didn't happen. But yeah, ABC wins wasn't right. I had said if they won, it was gonna be extremely bland. So Santana versus Jake San, uh, Mike Santana versus Jake something. Again, too long. Another really long match. This one meant nothing. This was just a match on the card that they built on Twitter. It meant absolutely nothing. Was it a bad match? No. It was probably one of the better matches on the card. Uh, Jake Something is usually involved in one of the better matches. Mike Santana, in a short time back, is, u- or is usually involved in one of the better matches. Like We knew we were going to get something good here. Again, went entirely too long. Mike Santana wins. Uh, there, there's a trend here. Again, babyface win, appease the crowd. That, that is the trend at this point. But Mike Santana wins. Uh, they threw us off as well with the main event because Moose was – I, I was saying, hey, Moose telegraphed that he's going to win the match because he's going to fight Mike Santana after this. I, I, they they really threw us off. They threw me off for sure. I can't speak for everyone else, but I know a lot of people that got thrown off as well. But I can only speak for myself and say, hey, I was wrong. Uh, but um, yeah, man, that I'm I'm still actually very shocked by that main event. 
that that really threw me through a loop because I'm I'm watching this whole show on my couch and I'm just I found myself bored several times, like I said, just because the matches were were too long. Rascals took on the no quarter catch crew. Uh, I didn't feel that the crowd was very invested in this. Uh, certain moments and certain spots, yes. But it was an NXT match, basically, with a couple TNA guys. The funny thing is, this is probably the largest crowd the no, no quarter catch crew has ever wrestled in front of, if not very, very close. But it's probably the largest crowd. Same with Wesley, which is funny because they're both in the bigger company. Uh, they're coming to TNA for a larger audience. So that's, that's it's kind of funny when you think about it. But I thought this was um, this was cool for for a nice, nostalgic, you know, rascals getting back together type of thing. And the Rascals end up winning here. They have a move called the Soup Kitchen. I think the name is freaking hilarious. They didn't win with it, uh, but I think that's a very funny name. But the Rascals do end up winning this thing. You know, no surprises. PCO takes on AJ Francis. And they've done this angle so many times. Attack PCO before the match. PCO is not going to show up. PCO shows up. He comes down with Smoke Dizza and uh, Josh Bishop, who I think they said was uh, Westside Gun is partial owner of House of Glory. So I think they said he was on his management team uh, and wrestles for him. He was actually a pretty impressive dude. I actually like to see him on the show. Uh, Rich Swan comes down. He's selling nothing. You remember he met, he wrestled earlier in the match. He's he's selling absolutely nothing. And I had said that this was probably going to turn into a street fight. And that it was the candidate for the most overbooked match on the show. And guess who won? BQ. Because that was the case for both of these. It becomes a Montreal street fight. The minute they say that, I have tuned out. I know they're going to start throwing weapons in there and chairs and all this nonsense. I hate street fights. I hate no DQ. I hate weapons. All that shit. When, when, I mean, when done properly, when the storyline calls for it, I can get behind it, but when they're just doing it to do it, like in this case, because they know it's probably not going to be that good of a match, I checked out. I saw people on Twitter saying hey, this was a great match and they really enjoyed it. This, it. this did nothing for me, so I maybe I'm wrong, which is entirely possible. This did nothing for me. Um, <clears throat> Sammy Callahan, comes, so this is a match. This is like, let's get everyone on the show. I was actually getting ready to commend TNA for saying, hey, you know, you, you fight your instincts to throw everyone on the show. You know, you're, you just put, you just took your select group of guys and girls and said, hey, boom, here, this is our, this is our group. So I was, you know, I commended them. I was like, wow, no Sammy, no Eric Young. You know, some of these guys don't have matches. I, I give them props. They threw everyone in this. So Sammy Callahan comes down. Sammy Calorie Ham, the bread machine. And then the human iPhone Rhino. Um, the snack machine. And I said, what the fuck? I don't, I seriously don't understand. I, I guess we all like different things. I cannot understand for the life of me while anyone's saying, wow, what a great match this was. There, there was... I mean, go from going to Street Fight and the random run-ins for the Sammy Callahan's and the Rhinos of the world. I just don't. I I cannot, for the life of me, wrap my head around why anyone thought this was good. But if you did, more power to you. And um, PCO, what the fuck is PCO going to do with these belts? AJ Francis was doing a good job. What what is PCO going to do with these titles? All of a sudden, we're putting the titles on people who can't cut promos. So in PCO, Speedball Mike Bailey, we'll get into that in a little bit. People who can't talk. Even the Knockouts Tag Team Champions. Alicia's not a great talker. Masha doesn't speak English on the show. So, the, yeah, yeah, this this did so little for me. Uh, but let's get everyone on the show, put the belts on PCO. we got to appease the audience because he... Was responsible for selling tickets. Then we get to Ash by Elegance versus Jordan Grace. And this was the match I was most critical of. Not the match, but the build was the thing I was most critical of. And I might I am here to tell you, looking you in the eyes, or into my camera at least, 
This was my favorite match of the night. I thought Ash by Elegance did a great job. I thought Jordan Grace did a good job. I always said on paper it should be good. They're so similar in stature. They're both athletes. On paper, it should have been a good match. I was super critical about the build. I didn't think they got enough heat on Ash. I thought there was too much comedy. And this match over-delivered. Over-delivered. I really thought it was the best match of the night. Uh, I thought the story they told was good. There was several times where you genuinely thought Ash was going to win the match. Even though in the back of your mind, like, Jordan's winning this thing. She has to. There were moments that looked like she was going to win. Rosemary came down and chases off the personal concierge. I think they set up uh, Ash and Hammerstone versus Jordan and um, Eric Young for the tapings. Again, we had audio issues, so we couldn't hear jack shit for, for the majority of the show. Sometimes the commentators were super loud. Sometimes they were super quiet. We couldn't hear some of the ring introductions. We couldn't hear some of the ring entrances, uh, the, the segments backstage we couldn't hear, or, or they had echo. I mean, this was one of their worst audio jobs. And it, it, Tom Hannafin in the main event had the nerve to run down the uh, the backstage crew by name and say, I promise you this is the hardest working team in wrestling. And this was the worst sounding show that they have put out in a while. And they've had snafus. They always do. But they don't last the entire show. You know, um, there was improvements as the show went on. But it really took away from my ability to enjoy the show. At least we could hear the crowd. But there were so many audio issues with this. V visually, it looked fine. It was a little dark, like I said. A little indie looking. It kind of improved as the night went. It was a good look seeing the rest, wa seeing the wrestlers walk a long entrance way to, way to the ring. I thought that was kind of cool. But I didn't have too many issues with it visually. It was audio that just sounded like complete crap. And I'm sitting here with my remote control turning up the volume. And then all of a sudden something yells at me. And I have to turn it all the way down. And then I can't hear shit. So very, very disappointed with this. This was not a, a good viewing. This, this was not for my viewing pleasure. Um, but to go back to what I was saying, Ash by Elegance and Grace, I thought they over-delivered. I enjoyed it. Uh, it probably did go a little long as well, but I, this was the only match I was like truly invested in, and I found myself cheering for Ash by Elegance. So I'm not going to call her Ash by Awful, Awful Sauce anymore until she pisses me off again. Uh, I'm going to return her Ash by Elegance name to her, but I, I'm, I was very impressed with her. I thought I just thought this was good, flat out, flat out good. Uh, but unfortunately, another match with a babyface wins, send the crowd home happy. Jordan Grace, the teaser of surprises, uh, gets the win here. Uh, Cheeseball Mike Bailey versus Mustafa Ali. This was trending towards match of the night. It, it was, they were doing some pretty amazing things while remaining logical. And it was going so well. And then we got the TNA ref bump. He took a super kick pretty good, Frank the Goof. Oh, I also I also said when PCO took on AJ Francis, I was like, it's going to be a street fight, and they're going to get the Goof ref, and they did both. But uh, the Goof, they had the Goof ref in this match. He took a super kick pretty well. Um, and then that's when it started falling apart. They showed Vita Scott, uh, Mike Bailey's wife, several times ringside. I would love for, the, for her, them to bring her on. I think she's great on commentary. Right now we've got oh, and a kick out and I would love that they added Veda Scott to that. Anyway, uh, this is when it fell apart and got overbooked. The most overbooked match was PCO versus AJ Francis, without a doubt. That was the most overbooked. This was a close second. Uh, we get a ref bump and. He calls, um, no, this is before that. One of his security guys pulls the ref out of the ring, removes his mask, and it's Trent all have a number seven with a Coke. Which I guess was, an, was a fun little, it's, it's fine. You're not overbooking too much. It, it was a fun little thing. It was, it was just another case of let's get everyone on the show. Let's pay everybody. So instead of just, as I said, Hey, we're going to put our guys and girls on this show, put the best show together. They're like, let's get everyone on there. 
by by hooker by hooker by crook. So uh, Trent, I'll have a number seven. Uh, quickly gets taken out by Mustafa Ali, and he grabs a plastic chair from under the ring and, and continues to hit him in that knee. And then he calls down uh, Earl Hebner, and they are teasing the Montreal screw job. But it wasn't the Montreal screw job because in the end he got vengeance. They were trying to do something positive. So he, I, I promise you this match did not erase the Montreal screw job. I can I can promise you that. They acted like he was gonna cost Ali the match. Uh, he took a bump inadvertently at one point and completely fell on his ass. Earl Hebner can barely walk. So this was very dangerous to have him involved in this, in my opinion. And then ultimately, Cheeseball Mike Bailey puts him in a sharpshooter, and Ali taps. So now we've got PCO, Mike Bailey, uh, who can't talk, and they're they're two of your champions. The win, but this had the opportunity to truly be the match of the night, and ended up getting overbooked and silly, and. Babyface wins again. Send the crowd home happy. And then we got the main event, which I already talked about the main event at the top of the show. I thought the main event got off to a very slow start. I thought there was a lot of overly choreographed moves. But then once we got past that, that portion of it, uh, and they really did a good job of getting Josh Alexander over with all those German suplexes, like as a baby face. Uh, but once we get, you know got past all that, it, it was a pretty good match. Um, I don't particularly like all these multi, you know, let's throw as many people in a match as possible. Uh, Moose <coughs> Moose gets pinned early in this thing, like I said at the top. And, it, I mean, you could hear a hush over the crowd knowing we were going to get a new world champion. I don't know what the hell they're going to do with the system here. Uh, none of them are champions except Alicia, of all people. She was the one who wasn't a champion at one point. So I would imagine she's losing that title very soon. And uh, Nick Nemeth, as I said, becomes a world champion. And we knew when they brought him to TNA that he was going to win a title at some point because that's what this company does. Um, but yeah, but legitimately when he lost his slam anniversary, I mean, excuse me, rebellion, it kind of became, well, when is he going to win it? Like we couldn't even fantasy book it. No one expected him to win this match. So it definitely came out of left field, um, him winning. We've got pretty much all babyface champions. We have babyfaces running this company. and went, uh, pretty. So all the heels are doing the chasing at this point. There's a lot of contractually obligated rematches that are going to happen. We know that much. Um, but, but I do want to give them props for really throwing us off the scent when it came to the main event, all the way from Moose being scared of Mike Santana to where he's thinking that's the match after this, to them making Josh Alexander seem like an afterthought on television. Uh, everything they did, you know? And then Nick Nemeth, who had attacked him and taken him out, I would have preferred uh, he continue to get the heat and win the world title because Frankie should win at some point too. This was his probably only opportunity to do so. So um, I'm wrapping I'm wrapping it up right there, guys. I usually keep my reviews around 45 minutes. This is about 33 right now, I believe, 34. Um, pay-per-views, I usually try to go a little bit quicker because there's not a lot promo wise and storyline wise that we can dive into like they're just kind of matches but you know to me this is four and a half hours of wrestling i'll reiterate what i said if you're a super fan you probably enjoyed this uh if, if you're a little more casual and by casual i don't mean uh you don't watch wrestling i just mean uh like okay i'll put it like this i consider myself a casual fan of wrestling because you can bring people from the Indies, from Japan, from Mexico. I've never heard of them. Okay. I don't sit there and watch every single company. I watch TNA and NWA. So there's a good chance that you're going to bring someone on screen and I have no clue who that is. So I consider myself a casual fan. I don't stay up at night watching New Japan, you know, at three in the morning watching the pay per views and shit like that. That isn't me. I just watch these couple companies and that is like the, uh, the realm of my knowledge. You know, I keep an eye. Uh, ear out for what WWE and AEW are doing, but you know, there's a lot of people who I've never heard of that you were like, oh, how can you not have heard this person? So I consider myself a casual. So if you're you're kind of in that ballpark, I think you just thought it was a fine show. 
and I, I give it a B. I give it a B. That's going to do it for me, folks. If I disappointed you with this review because you wanted to hear me get on here and say this was uh, this delivered, I apologize because this for me, uh, there was TNA plus shows that were better than this uh, this calendar year. And I think there's going to be TNA plus shows after this that are going to be better than this show ultimately was. Wasn't a bad show. It was just a show. That'll do it for me, folks. I'm your boy, BQ. I'm going to head to uh, bed here shortly. I'll talk to you guys soon.